Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out on this dreary night. But I, I've lived here this time of year for several months, so I know it's always a dreary night. So I guess you're used to it. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Humanist Society of the University of Edinburgh for inviting me and the, the students at Glasgow, as well, the adults at Glasgow as well, I guess, because um, I'll be giving a talk um, there on Monday evening. Um, this Edinburgh and Glasgow are the home of the Gifford Lectures. I don't know if you know those. They're very famous lectures that were endowed to reconcile science and religion. And they've been given by a lot of famous um, accommodationists and a few contrarians like Carl Sagan. So you can think of this as sort of a splenetic version of the Gifford Lectures that I'm going to give tonight. The topic is, as it says there, why science and religion shouldn't cohabit. It's about the incompatibility between science and religion. So let's... Uh, Okay, so the problem I want to talk about tonight is the extremely widespread view that science and faith are compatible, harmonious, friendly, amiable, and indeed can contribute to each other's welfare. Um, this view, which I've, if you read my website, you know, I call accommodationism, the, the view that religion and science can be accommodated um, with each other. And what I want to talk about tonight is, first of all, how pervasive this view is. You may think, well, this isn't a problem in the UK, but it is. Um, the reason why this is becoming increasingly uh, problematic, or you hear so much more about science and religion now than you did, say, 10 or 15 years ago, I'll talk a little bit about what science and religion are and why I consider them incompatible. I'll then um, segue to the way that theologians fight back against the notion that they are incompatible which I will maintain they are. And at the end, I'll talk about, and maybe a little bit in the middle, about um, why it's a problem to begin with. Why, shouldn't we, why are we even worried about this to start off with? Um, so the first thing I want to do is demonstrate why accommodationism, or the view that science and religion are compatible, is pervasive. Certainly in the United States, it's pervasive. And I know it's in the UK, it's pervasive as well, because I read the news from over here. Um, the combination is best demonstrated by this guy, who's probably the most famous scientist in the United States. This is Francis Collins, who's head of the National Institutes of Health. He also happens to be an evangelical Christian who founded this organization called BioLogos, which is explicitly meant to reconcile science and evangelical Christianity. Um, in particular, to convince fundamentalists, evangelical Christians, who believe in the literal truth of the Bible, that evolution was okay. Um, he's failed miserably in this endeavor, but it's cost him a million, several million dollars to do that. Um, so here we have an example of one of the many organizations in the U.S. which is devoted to reconciling science and religion. And a lot of these organizations and initiatives are funded by this rather nefarious organization called the John Templeton Foundation. It, it, you, many of you may know who Templeton was. He was a venture capital and hedge fund and um, mutual fund entrepreneur who, when he died, decided he would leave his fortune to the business of reconciling science and religion. And the mission, as you can see here, serves as a philanthropic catalyst for discoveries re relating to the big questions of human purpose and ultimate reality. Um, big questions is a euphemism for religion. It used to be called the, the Templeton Foundation um, for, re for religion but they realized that wasn't going to make it. So they, they say now they answer the big questions, which sounds much more scientific. But the questions still are, remain the same. And the problem is that the Templeton Foundation is enormously endowed with money. Um, they have a $1.5 billion endowment, which is much larger than most universities in the United States. And every year they give $70 million to scientists and other people who are faith friendly. Um, and the explicit aim or implicit aim is to show that science and religion have things to contribute to each other. So there's a lot of money going into this endeavor, and a lot of scientists lined up with their hands out, willing to take their money in order to, um, to fulfill their mission. Accommodationism is pervasive, not only in the private sector, like the Templeton Foundation, but also within the Scientific Academy itself in America. There, most American um, scientific societies have made official statements about the compatibility of science and religion. Here's one of the most famous ones, the AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science. 
And their official statement is this, I put the relevant parts in red, science and religion ask fundamentally different questions about the world. Many religious leaders have affirmed that they see no conflict between science and religion. I mean, they leave out, of course, that many religious leaders, in America at least, have affirmed that they do see a conflict between science and religion. So this is only, whoops, sorry, basically only a half truth. But this is the sort of Steve Gouldian non-overlapping magisteria view that science and religion occupy separate spheres of inquiry and therefore do not overlap. That's wrong, by the way. Um, they do overlap, and I'll tell you why. Um, here's another one. This is by the most prestigious body of scientists in America, the National Academy of Sciences, which you have to be elected to, and you have to be really, really prestigious. It's so prestigious that I'm not even a member. Um, but again, they've made a statement, which is here in red, um, because uh, they are not part of nature, supernatural entities cannot be investigated by science, which is not true again. And we can talk about that in the question and answer session if you want. In that sense, science and religion, blah, 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 are separate and address aspects of human understanding in different ways. Attempts to pin science and religion against each other create controversy where none needs to exist. Okay. You know, the interesting thing about the National Academy of Sciences is that 93% of the people that belong to this are atheists and probably would not sign on to this statement. This was written by the president of the National Academies. And I could put up statement after statement after statement like this, but it would all just go to show you the same thing, that American bodies of science are desperately trying to show that what they do is compatible with religion. We like our grant money, we don't like the public to which is largely religious in America, to think that we're up to something that undermines religion. Okay, so if, the, if science and religion really are completely independent areas, as those, people, as those scientific statements maintain, why are we worried about whether they're compatible or not? I mean, it's like worrying whether tennis is compatible with Rembrandt, I mean, if they're two different things. And the answer to this question is, first of all, they're not independent. And everybody knows that, because both science and religion claim to make statements about real things that exist in the universe. And therefore, they are engaged in the same endeavor. Although the things they're looking for might be different things, the, what they're trying to find out is about things that are real. And I'll give you evidence for that in a minute. And second of all, because they're not compatible, and people know it. And I'll show you this in a minute. I mean, Americans realize that there is a deep incompatibility between science and religion. I'll tell you in a few minutes my own notion of what I mean by compatibility between these two realms of endeavor. First of all, if science and religion are so compatible as these scientific bodies assert, then why do we have these problems? First of all, in America, as you may know, there's widespread opposition to evolution. It's not so widespread in the United Kingdom, but it's still here. Okay. Second of all, we have the rise of organizations like BioLogos trying to harmonize science and faith. We have lots and lots of books. If you go to the library, I'm sure here um, at the University of Edinburgh, looking at the science and religion shelves, you'll find millions, well not millions, but thousands of books that try to harmonize science and faith. And that attack the New Atheist books that claim that there is no harmony between science and faith. There's a conflict between religion and science, seen by many people in my country. This hasn't been polled in the UK, but I'll show you the data in a minute. And finally, we have this high rate of atheism among scientists, which is much higher than it is amongst the general public, particularly in America. So here's the data on that. Um, if you poll scientists at so-called elite American universities, um, you find that 72% of them are agnostics or atheists. If you look at members of the National Academy of Sciences, you find that 93% of, of them are agnostic or atheists. And it's true that the higher up the ladder you go in terms of scientific achievement in my country, the more and more atheism you get. So the very top scientists are also the most resistant to religion. But if you look at the American public as a whole, and actually these figures are exaggerated, um, it could be as little as 6%. 16% of the American public, according to one poll, are agnostic or atheist. So we see this real disconnect between the degree of religious belief of scientists and non-scientists. Now, if those two endeavors are completely compatible, why do we see this in the first place? Okay. Religious belief is very different among scientists and um, the general public. I just showed you that, but there's some recent statistics from up to 2009 about um, how, 
What proportion of the general public believes in God? That's this olive colored line here. Doesn't know or believes in spiritual, um, these are the so-called spiritualists, spiritualists, those who don't believe in God, but say they believe in some higher power or mystical spirit, has 12% and 4% are atheists um, in America. You can see the figures on atheists and agnostics vary depending on the poll. But if you look at scientists, you find that the number of people who believe in God, the proportion as a whole, goes down from 83% to 33%. And the number of atheists rises tenfold from 4% to 41%. So here again, we see this huge difference between people that engage in scientific activities and the general public in how religious they are. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? Okay. And there's two possibilities. Atheists are attracted to science, but there's something about doing science that turns you into an atheist. Both of these factors are undoubtedly at play, but I think that the latter is probably the more important one. In terms of conflicts between religion and science, if you poll the American public, do you see a problem? Is there a conflict between religion and science? And in general, people say yes. Um, just look at the top line here. Um, the, so on the left here, we have the general public, and those who see a conflict are in olive, those who don't see a conflict are in blue. So 55% of the American public say, yes, there are conflicts between science and religion. What I'm trying to do here is just show you that people perceive that there's a problem. This is not proof that there is a problem. I'll give you my take in a few minutes on um, why I think they are in conflict. Um, if the statistics become somewhat less, if you ask people the science conflict with your own religious belief, only 36% of people say no, and 61%, sorry, 36% of them say yes, and 61% of them say no. But even so, those are substantial figures. So the public does recognize that there is a conflict between religion and science. And they're not stupid. I mean, there is something going on here, which I think is um, indicative of how widespread the problem is. A couple of years ago, I wrote a column for USA Today, which is sort of the Daily Mail of the United States. It doesn't show naked women on page three, but it's a tabloid which is um, read by the average people. Are, and I was lucky to get this in there because this is not a popular topic, saying that science and religion are incompatible. And you can see it got, got 1,319 comments. They're very pleased with that. Although this newspaper is not friendly to atheism, they're friendly to business and traffic. So they like that. And so I can write for them. Again, but that's a lot of comments. And of course, the vast majority of those said I was um, full of crap, that I didn't know what I was talking about, that I was hostile to religion, that I was strident, um, that I didn't really understand what religion meant, you know, the usual thing that atheists get when they just say, you know, I, don't, I have a problem with God. Um, it's probably the most telling evidence about, of the incompatibility between science and faith comes from a poll taken by Time Magazine in 2006. And they pulled the average sample of Americans asking them this question. If science found a fact that contradicted the tenets of your faith, what would you do? And you had three choices. Keep the fact and give up the tenet of your faith. Um, reject the scientific fact and retain the tenet of your faith. And the third one was, I don't know. I mean, I'm confused. I, I don't want to answer that question. So what percentage of Americans, do you, I will put this in here, but what percentage of Americans do you think would reject the fact in favor of their faith? Any guesses from the audience? 50. What did you say? 50. 50? Anybody? Can I have a higher number? 60. 60? <laughs> higher than that? <laughs> it's actually 64%. So that means that two out of three Americans, if they're faced with a scientific fact, and by scientific fact, I mean something that is so blatantly true that you would be foolish to reject it. That's what we scientists regard as a fact. Two out of three Americans would reject that in order to hold on to some aspect of their religion. Okay. This, is a, this is a contradiction between an incompatibility between science and religion. They will reject something that every scientist will accept if it goes against their faith. And that's why evolution, for example, which is about as much a fact as anything else in science, is rejected by so many Americans. And how many Americans it's rejected by, I'll talk about in a few minutes. Well, actually, I can do that now. Um, this is so embarrassing for me to talk about my country and how benighted it really is. 
But if you pull Americans and ask them what percentage of you believe in the angels, and by angels I don't just mean spirits, you know, the, the idea of angels, I mean real physical angels or ethereal angels, things that fly around and do what angels are supposed to do, you get 63%. 63 to 70% is what you get if you ask Americans, do you believe in angels? Do you believe in the existence of Satan? Do you believe in the existence of hell? That's a pretty high figure. And when you walk around the streets in America, you realize that seven out of 10 people around you think that Satan is a real person. And yet if you ask them, you know, do you accept evolution as true? What you get is a figure of at best 40%. In other words, 30% um, less, 30% fewer people accept Darwin than believe in the literal existence of angels. And this is really embarrassing um, as a fact about America. If you ask people if they believe in the naturalistic form of evolution, that is, there is evolution and God has nothing to do with it, then it goes down to 16%, one out of six. So there's this real disparity in between what scientists believe, which is overwhelmingly that evolution is true, and... Um, what religious people believe. I'm, I'm further evidence, as if I need to give you any, of um, conflict between religion and science. This is a graph I made from data that come from several places. Um, 32 European countries were polled, and for each country the citizens were asked, this is separate data from separate polls, do you accept evolution and do you believe in God? And the belief in God is, is judged in various ways. In this way, I think it's how often do you pray? Do you pray more than once a day to yourself? And then each of these dots is a separate country. And you can see that amongst these 32 countries, there's this negative correlation between acceptance of evolution and belief in God. So those countries that have the highest belief in God, that's Turkey, for example, also have the lowest acceptance of evolution. So there's something here that shows that there's a negative correlation. It would be even stronger if you included sub-Saharan African countries and countries in the Middle East where there is no belief in evolution in places like Iraq. They just don't even teach it there, or Syria. And the belief of God is extremely high, almost 100%. Then the line would go all the way down to there. But anyway, that's the least squares regression line for a statistician. This is highly significant. Where's the U.S.? We're right here, second lowest to Turkey. This is very embarrassing. We have about 80% belief in God and about 40% acceptance of evolution. Um, that's, again, that acceptance of evolution is a maximum. Where's the U.K.? You guys are doing much better, okay? So 80, you have about 75% acceptance of evolution and about 40% belief in God. But you fall pretty well on the line. The U.S. is even lower. We're a hyper-religious country for reasons that I won't get into, but can talk about later. But again, this shows that there's this sort of conflict. The more you believe in Darwin, the less you believe in God. Now, there's several reasons why this might be true. Um, one of which is that the more you come to accept evolution because of the facts, the more you give up God. That's probably true to some extent, certainly. People like Richard Dawkins have confessed this explicitly. But it's more likely that your belief in God is something that comes to you when you're very young. It's inculcated by your parents. That immunizes you against the acceptance of evolutionary biology. And there are data which show that that's indeed the way it works here. Um, you start off with the belief in God, and the, the more religious you are, the less willing you are to accept the scientific effects of evolution. So here, again, we see evidence for incompatibility. Okay, so that's the pervasiveness of, of, of the problem in the United States, the desperate desire to make evolution and religion compatible, even though the data shows that they aren't. And the question is, well, why is this happening now? There's all these spates of books that are being issued trying to find harmony between science and religion. Just go to your local library and look at the bookshelf for science and religion. You'll be stunned at how many books there really are. Almost all of those books show that they're compatible rather than incompatible. Why now? Well, this is one obvious answer. It's the rise of new atheism, which started with Richard Dawkins' God Delusion, which I think was 2006. Then Sam Harris's book, Christopher Hitchens and Dan Dennett. And these books have an explicitly scientific cast, too many of them. Richard is a scientist. Sam Harris is a neuroscientist. Christopher Hitchens has a great respect for and writes about science. And the, and the rise of new atheism is connected deeply with the rise of a scientific attitude towards things. And also an explicit call for evidence. 
So one of the characteristics of New Atheism is that it may, New Atheists ask religious people to give evidence for their beliefs in a sort of scientific way. Why do you believe what you do? Um, what is the evidence for your belief? And that puts religious people on the defensive because they're now in the ring with scientists arguing about evidence. Okay. And in fact, each of those three books has spawned a number of things that Richard calls fleas, um, letters against them. So there's Sam's books, and these are the books by religious accommodationism showing why they're wrong. Here's Richard's books, and then there's 10 books that have been published refuting the God delusion. It's gotten people very angry. Okay. So that's one reason. That the rise of new atheism has spawned um, a counterattack on the part of religious people who do not like the idea that they have to provide evidence for their beliefs. Um, the rise of science also threatens people in other ways. Um, there are recent findings about science which make people who are religious uncomfortable. First of all, of course, is the most common in America is evolution is true. Every day we get more evidence for evolution. By now it is unequivocally established, and people don't like that very much, at least Americans. It threatens their worldview. It threatens their self-image. It threatens their view of something creature that was created specially by God um, as his sole object of creation. Cosmology and the Big Bang, the idea that the universe literally did come from nothing, or at least from a quantum vacuum, threatens people. Um, if we're just the result of some huge explosion that happened 14 billion years ago, what does that mean? And the fact that we're going to all be incinerated in 5 million, billion years, what does that mean? It doesn't make us seem very special. Um, the fact that morality, which was previously had no explanation scientifically at all, is now beginning to receive scientific explanations by people like Franz de Waal. Sorry, Franz de Waal. We can see moral sentiments in their rudiments in our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, and we're beginning to understand you know, either the evolutionary or secular cultural basis of morality, a phenomenon which was once imputed solely to God. The increasing notion, which I will defend with my dying breath, that we don't have free will, that we're beginning to realize that we do not have free to make free choices that are made by our unconscious, many often well before we think we've made those decisions. This is deeply threatening to religious people because, of course, free will is, an, is a very deep part of many religions, such as Christianity. You have to freely accept Jesus or not before you're going to go to heaven. If you can't do that, then the religion has no meaning whatsoever. And yet this is what psychology is telling us right now. So what this creates is a situation in which people don't want to be thought of as hicks or rubes or backwards. They want to be with it. They want to be scientific and be up with the latest scientific findings. But yet these scientific findings like these make you uncomfortable because they sort of hit your religion in the solar plexus. And this causes this sort of cognitive dissonance between religion and science. It is an incompatibility because all of these things are at odds with some religions and some notions of religion. And finally, this was told to me recently by an Anglican, an ex-Anglican priest, that one of the reasons that religious people are so desperate to comport their own beliefs with science is because science is part of, I mean, I don't know how true this is, but it sounds convincing to me, that science is part of the human story. It's a human endeavor. It's been remarkably successful in helping humanity. And theologies are about the human story. And therefore, if you're going to have an up-to-date, sophisticated modern theology, you have to incorporate science in it. So these are reasons why scientists, why religious people want to comport faith with science. These are the reasons why they find it difficult to do so. Okay, probably the most telling statement on why science makes religious people uncomfortable is by John Hott, a theologian, oh, um, I'll actually give his statement in a minute, a theologian I debated a couple of years ago in Kentucky, and it all comes from this statement, which you may be familiar with. Stephen Weinberg, who was a Nobel laureate in physics, who unified two of the fundamental forces, made this statement in one of his books. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. Okay. He's since backed off a little bit for that. What he, mean, what he says he means by that is that we don't have a point that was given to us by a deity. Um, we can make our own points. But of course, we knew that's what he meant in the first place. But regarding this statement, this theologian John Hott said the following, 
Religion can put up with all kinds of particular scientific ideas, so long as these ideas do not contradict the sense that the whole scheme of things is meaningful. And by meaningful, he means meaningful in a way where the meaning is given to you by some divine being. What people cannot abide is the conviction that the universe and the life and life are pointless which is what really science is telling us. Pointless in the sense that there is no externally imposed purpose or point in the universe. As atheists, this is something that is manifestly true to us. We make our own meaning and purpose. But for theologians, to th that's anathema. A meaning and purpose has to be given to them from the outside. So the lesson of science seems to be what Weinberg says. And yet, you can see here, what, this is something that religious people cannot abide. So here we see the fundamental conflict between science and religion. It is a conflict of meaning and purpose and specialness in the universe. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about how pervasive the conflict it is, why it's happening now. Why is it important? Why am I talking about this? Um, why, I mean, why aren't I talking about the compatibility between science and art or science and food or something like that? Um, it matters for several reasons. First of all, it, it's a, if science and religion are considered compatible ways of looking at the universe, or complementary ways, that's a pollution of science by superstition. Um, this is manifested by people like Francis Collins, for example, who goes around saying that science provides evidence for superstition, the moral law, the fact that humans have morality is evidence for God, the fact that um, the laws of nature are fine-tuned for the existence of humans provides evidence for God. So when you mix up science and religion and try to comport them in this way, it really is a pollution of science and the naturalism on which science is based. There's the false idea promulgated by theologians that other ways of knowing are as valid as science. And by other ways of knowing, they mention things like art and music and literature um, and jurisprudence, and it's a matter of debate whether those are indeed ways of knowing about the universe. We can argue about that. I haven't settled that in my own mind. But of course, the real thing that the theologians are doing is trying to show that the religious way of knowing is another way to understand the universe, which is through revelation. Um, theologians who are engaged in the religion science debate make unfair and untenable criticisms of science which are insupportable, and I'll talk about these a little bit later. Um, the false idea that religion can produce knowledge is promulgated by this idea that science and religion are compatible. And finally, the most injurious thing, I think, is that religious knowledge is different from scientific knowledge in that you think you have the absolute truth when you're religious and you don't when you're a scientist. And when you think you're in possession of the absolute truth that is, is given to you from above, you're liable to do all kinds of dangerous things, and his, history bears witness to this. So let me start off by the, well, just by the compatibility argument, by defining what I mean by science and religion and compatibility. And then we'll go on to see how theologians deal with it. Science, you know what science is. For, how many of you do science in this room? Or, okay, so there's a lot of them. And the rest of you know how science works, so I'm not gonna go into this. There isn't really any scientific method. We know now that scientists work in a variety of ways to find out how, what is true about the universe, but we know there's certain things about science that are generally true, that it is, has to be based on repeatability. Somebody else has to be able to find out the same thing you did. There's referees that check your results. You always are constantly looking for flaws in your experiments to see if you're wrong. Other people are constantly looking for flaws in your experiments. And everything that you find out as a truth in science is provisional. There are no absolute truths in science. There are things that come pretty close, like water is H2O. That's the formula. Someday, but, and evolution is pretty close too. But we not, science never claims that we have the absolute handle on reality, and what we know is ch always changing to some degree, okay? It's based on repeatable observations, experiments, replication, and falsifiability. The best characterization of science I've ever seen is this one given by Richard Feynman. The first principle that you, is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. So you have to be very careful about that. And I know this, because when you're at the lab bench, you really, really, really want your experiments to come out a certain way many times. And unfortunately, they don't come out that way. So science is there to keep you from publishing stuff that is what you want, even though it's not true. And so science is really basically a very sophisticated 
system of methodology, and I, th I consider science to be not a body of knowledge, but a method of finding out stuff. It's a procedure rather than the accumulated wisdom of ages, which changes over time. The procedure doesn't change. Um, and it's all based on keeping you from fooling yourself, from finding out the results you want rather than what's true about the universe. And the fact that it's competitive and you have people that are trying to undermine you and stuff, that's all to the good because it means the truth will out. Religion, on the other hand, is based on fooling yourself. I mean, that's the whole premise of religion, is that you want to fool yourself into believing what you want to be true. And that's the antithesis, the complete antithesis of what Richard Feynman is saying here. Okay, real religion, we know how that works. Um, I won't ask how many of you are religious. I'm sure some of you are, and that's fine, because we'll have a lively question and answer session. But it's basically based on faith, dogma, authority, and revelation. It's complete, the method of finding out truth, if there is such a thing in religion, is based on a completely different way that truth is found out in science. Faith, and this is not a pejorative definition, is belief without evidence. Here it is in the Bible, the two definitions, the assurance of things hoped for, the convention conviction of things not seen, and then doubting Thomas, of course, who stuck his hands into Jesus' side, you know, to see if he really did have those wounds, and he, that was a bad thing to do. You should believe without having to have done that. So that's from John. Um, so this is a completely different way of accepting what's true. When you're a child and you learn about Jesus and stuff, you're not given evidence. You're just said, this is the way things are. Religious ideas do change, too. I mean, they're not the same now exactly as they were in medieval times, although many of them are. But religious ideas don't change because we find a greater understanding of God or how he works. We don't know one iota more about who God is or what God is like than we did in the 12th century. Why not? Because we have no way of finding out. So we, but religion has changed. It's become more friendly to gays. It's become more friendly to women except for the Anglicans this week. Um, <laughs> but that does not come from some spiritual revelation. It comes from the pressure of secularism in society. The Mormons had the revelation that black people could be ministers when the pressure from the Civil Rights Movement was so great that they could no longer maintain this view that black people weren't suited to be part of their church. That's what's happening to you and the Anglicans right now. Women are it's becoming increasingly realized that women deserve moral equality to males, and this pressure is bearing on the Anglican Church, and they almost gave in to it this week. And I wish they would have, but if they had, it wouldn't have come from some revelation that all of a sudden we know that women can be bishops. It would come from the pressure of secular society. So religion, insofar as religion changes, and it doesn't change very fast, that does not come from any greater understanding of the nature of God or anything like that. It comes from pressure from secular society, things that are happening outside of religion itself. Okay. And so I've redefined science in terms of religion here. It's the assurance of things that do exist and hope for or not. That's important. The truth is the truth whether you like it or not, and the conviction of things seen rather than hope for. Hebrew refers to my previous incarnation as a Jew, <laughs> which I gave up when I was 16. Again, in science, faith is a vice. If you have faith or belief that this is true without evidence, you're doing something wrong that's inimical to the scientific method. In religion, faith is a virtue. It is a virtue to believe and not to question, although this is greater or lesser amounts of questioning or tolerated in some churches. In science, you have ways of knowing that you're wrong. Many people think, as Karl Popper adumbrated, that one of the hallmarks of science is falsifiability. An argument is not a scientific one unless there's a way to show that that's wrong. And I adhere to that largely. Um, I th evolution, there's a lot of ways that you can show that evolution is wrong. I'm an evolutionary biologist, and there are some things that would convince me it was wrong. We don't have those things because evolution isn't wrong. But we have ways of, that we could tell it we're wrong. And in religion, there is no way of knowing whether you're wrong. Absolutely no way at all except for certain of the tenets which can be disproven by science. Okay, here's the most common argument made to show the compatibility between science and faith. And that's this, the existence of scientists who are religious. How many of you know Simon Conway Morris? He's one of yours. I, well, I don't know, I mean, he's not Scottish. He's at Cambridge. And, um, he's a very famous paleontologist and he's also a Catholic. 
Um, and Kenneth Miller is also a Catholic in the United States, and they're both good scientists, especially Simon Conway Morris, who did pathbreaking work on the Burgess Shale fossils. So people say, well, look, these guys are religious. They go to church every Sunday, they're Catholics, and yet they're scientists at the same time. So doesn't that show that science and religion are compatible? And my answer to that is simple. Well, if you can hold two things in your mind that are that different, if you can go to the lab and do one thing and then go to church on Sunday and profess something that's completely inimical to science, then you're not, that doesn't show compatibility, that shows cognitive dissonance. The simultaneous embracing in your mind of two worldviews that are at odds with one another. I mean, I can show that lots of Catholics are pedophiles, and yet does that mean that Catholicism and pedophilia are compatible with one another? Certainly not. It just means that people can sexually abuse children and at the same time say mass. We all know that that's happened a lot. So, so this doesn't demonstrate compatibility of science, it demonstrates cognitive dissonance. Okay, now I'll tell you what I really mean by compatibility. And you, well, okay, um, cognitive dissonance. Okay, before I tell you what I mean by compatibility between science and religion and why they're incompatible, um, let me just assert, and believe me, this is true because I've read a lot of theology over the last year, that theologians, many of them, not all of them, claim that they are indeed finding out true things about the universe through religion. And that if those things were not true, they would not believe in their belief. I mean, the most common one for Christians is the resurrection. Many, many theologians have said, if the resurrection didn't happen, Christianity crumbles. I'm not going to be a Christian anymore. That, so that is a belief that's founded on a scientific claim. Here's two bits of evidence. This is John Polkinghorn, a Brett a physicist turned, I think, Anglican priest. Um, theology is not just concerned with the collection of stories that motivate an attitude towards life. That's the sort of Kierkegaardian, non- a religious religion um, that many sophisticated theologians believe. It must have its anchorage in the way things actually are and in the way they happen. This is an assertion that religion at bottom is based on true things about the universe. I mean, I could give you pages and pages of statements like this. Just take my word for it. Here's John Hott again. On contrary, religion is about the deepest of all realities. And to anyone who takes it seriously, it is about what is most real. This sounds a little bit like A.A. A. Milne here. but. <laughs> Um, and so I looked up reality in the Oxford English Dictionary and its real existence, what is real rather than imagined or desired, the aggregate of real things or existence. So let nobody try to tell me that religious people aren't claiming that they're making true statements about the universe. Some of them will claim that I'm not saying that there's a resurrection, I'm not saying that Jesus was divine, I'm not saying that, that Muhammad was the prophet of Allah, but those are the rare ones compared to most of the religious people in the world who do indeed found their religion on the existence of true things about the universe. So theologians on the one hand want to say, okay, my religion rests on certain bedrock truths. But at the same time, they tell us this. If we find that certain of their assertions prove to be wrong scientifically, like Noah's flood, like the existence of Adam and Eve, like evolution overturning the creation stories of Genesis. Then they come back with this. The Bible is not, however, a textbook of science. And whenever you read that statement, you have to think to yourself, translate that into what it really means. The Bible is not true. <laughs> That's what they mean when they say that. It's not a textbook of science. What it means is it doesn't tell you the way things are about the universe, even though we just told you before that we're claiming that things are true about the universe. But of course, as I said, religions do make assertions about the real world. It makes claims that God is of a certain nature, beneficent, omnipotent, omniscient, and works in certain ways. And although the Bible is not a textbook of science, it's a partial textbook of science because there are certain truths which cannot be dispensed with for you to keep your religion. Fundamental amongst those in Christianity is, um, is the resurrection and, and the virgin birth. You probably heard of the Pope this week published the third volume of his biography of Jesus and asserted that, yes, there is a virgin birth and you Catholics have to believe that. So, um, and that goes against everything that embryology and human reproduction tells us. So some of the claims in the Bible. So this is what happens when you claim that you're finding truth, but then science shows that some of those truths aren't really true. Your claims get falsified. Well, that happens all the time in science. You make an observation that falsifies something like the faster than light neutrinos where they found out it was just a loose wire in one of the measuring apparatuses. Well, when that happens, you just discard your claim. 
when science disproves something. When science disproves something that religion does, it becomes a metaphor, okay? <laughs> it's never, so Adam and Eve and the fall and all the Genesis and stuff, the religious people don't say, okay, we're gonna get rid of those. Those weren't really true. They say, oh, they meant something other than what we think they did, and here's what they really mean. They're in this constant process of revising things as science makes advances and pushes religion into a corner. Okay, but yet they still profess to believe real things. Here's the Nicene Creed. How many of you have know of this or have said this yourself? Every Catholic or most Catholics in America say this. I think the Anglicans say this. The Eastern Orthodox people say this. Um, I'm not going to go into this. You could, there are several versions of it. It's not in the Bible. It's a sort of a political maneuver meant to reconcile various warring factions at the Council of Nicaea. But in red, I put all the, the factual statements that people say that they believe in. The virgin birth, um, God's going to come, Jesus is going to come back again, and he's going to judge you, you're going to have an afterlife, you have to have baptism for the remission of sins, um, the dead will be resurrected. All of these are factual statements. So there's the Virgin Mary, right? Um, that God, Jesus, sits up in heaven with the Father. These are all statements about things that are true about the universe. This is not a metaphor. This is the profession of what people really believe and what they say in church on Sunday. Many, many people. Okay. So, does religion reveal truth? They claim that they're in the business of finding out what truth is. But the answer is no, they haven't found out what truth is. Um, over thousands of years, religious inquiry, to my mind at least, has not produced a single truth, at least about the universe. I mean, you can say, well, they produce moral truths. You know, don't kill your neighbor, be nice to people. But those, those were secular truths that long antedated the Bible. And those aren't even truths in the same way as scientific truths. Those are moral dicta. Those aren't objective truths about the universe. So over thousands of years of inquiry, despite the fact that religious people claim they're in the business of finding out how the universe works, they haven't produced a single truth about the universe. Theological knowledge does not expand. We know no more about the nature of God than we did in the 13th century. Things change. I mean, now we have processed theology, we have sophisticated theology, we have Kierkegaard, but nobody knows which one of these is right. All of them are just graspings in the dark trying to define what a non-existent being is like. And insofar as theological knowledge changes, it changes not because of a realization of the nature of God is this way rather than that, or um, this is true rather than that's true. It changes because secular society is forcing religion to go in a certain direction. And the most obvious way that that's true is that the religious truths of different faiths are conflicting. If religion was a way of finding truth, you'd expect that different religions would converge on the same truth. Right, they would have the same core sets of assertions, and they don't. I mean, one of the prime examples is that there's a mosque just a couple of blocks away, and the people that go to that mosque think that you will burn in hell if you think that Jesus was the Son of God. That's in the Quran. On the other hand, there are probably people in Edinburgh, certainly a lot of in my country, that think that unless you accept Jesus as the Son of God, you're going to burn in hell. So you can't have both of those views at the same time. Um, religious, the different religions do not converge on truth. Different scientists do converge on truth. It doesn't matter whether you're a Hindu physicist or a Jewish physicist or an atheist physicist or a Muslim physicist, you will come to the same conclusions about the nature of the universe. So that's another fundamental difference and irreconcilable fact between science and religion. Okay, so here's the incompatibilities that I find between religions. It's threefold, first methodological. I've already told you how the methods of science differ from the methods of religion, if indeed religion has methods. Philosophical difference between science and religion. Um, that is, um, we know scientists no longer not only have to consider the existence of a supernatural being when we're making our theories in the way that Newton or Kepler or those people did, when that's proven to be useless, it's proven to be so useless that we no longer even accept the existence of a supernatural being. I mean, provisionally we can say, well, there might be a God that could affect our experiments, but we've never seen it happen. So for all practical purposes, let's just say that there is no, that God doesn't exist in the same way that the Loch Ness Monster doesn't exist or Bigfoot doesn't exist. There's been no evidence for these creatures in the history of time, so let's, you know, let's just get rid of them. So that's a philosophical incompatibility. And finally, there's an incompatibility in outcomes between science and religion. They reach incompatible conclusions about the universe. It didn't have to be that way. 
If the Bible was right and was a textbook of science, as it was long regarded to be until Darwin came along by most people, he can talk about St. Augustine and stuff, but really in many ways he was a literalist and so was Aquinas. They reach incompatible conclusions about the universe. Here's some of the incompatible conclusions that science and religion have reached about the universe. The existence of evolution. That's scientifically true. Many religious people and certainly the scriptures, um, the Bible, and I'm largely talking about the Abrahamic faiths here because I'm, those are the ones that are most familiar with and most familiar with Judaism and Christianity rather than Islam. But Islam is much more incompatible with science than at least in terms of its adherence, then is um, Christianity and Judaism. Adam and Eve, a bedrock belief of, of the Catholic Church. We know now that they don't exist. They couldn't have existed. The Great Flood, the fact that prayer works, that's been tested scientifically and it doesn't. The fact that there's a virgin birth and a resurrection. Well, we can't prove that they didn't happen, but it violates every decent notion of how humans reproduce. Um, these are outcomes that are outcomes of religious inquiry which are incompatible with outcomes of scientific inquiry. So we have this threefold incompatibility based on methods, based on philosophy, and based on outcomes of research. And this is what I mean when I say science and religion are incompatible. Not that there are some scientists who are religious or some religious people who are science friendly. Okay. Now, I'm getting close to the end. Theologians realize that they have a problem with science. And they spent pages and pages of ink, which I, over the last year, have had to painfully slog through, as Luke said, trying to show how you can reconcile these two reconcilable areas. And they do it in a number of ways, which fall into a number of discrete categories when you've actually read a lot of theology. The first way is that you say that the Bible doesn't really say what it seems to say, especially if science says otherwise. In other words, everything that science has has disproven about the Bible, you just say, well, that's, that was a metaphor, you know? And if you're really Weasley, you'll say, we knew it all along, <laughs> okay? Um, second of all, you claim that theology involves a search for truth, but it, it isn't. It is a rationalization of the things that you were taught to believe or that you want to believe. The latter most obviously is the fact that you don't die for good, that you come back in another form. The gross fabrication of arguments for whole cloth. Theologians are very good at this. They make stuff up when they get into a tight corner. I'll give you examples of all of these in a minute. And some of them are quite humorous. They rationalize every single observation as comporting with God's plan. It does not matter what you see about the world. If there's one observation that would, to me, show that there wasn't any God, it would be the Holocaust. But believe me, theologians have gotten around that. And I could give you five or six ways that they've shown that really, the Holocaust is part of God's plan, you know. Um, after all, and it makes sense if you really know what God is like. Um, unfounded claims to understand the nature and intention of God. We don't know what, what God is like, much less whether he's omnipotent, omniscient, or omnibenevolent. Um, but yet those claims are made repeatedly. Even though those same theologians, when asked about things like the Holocaust, will say, well, we don't know what's really in God's mind. Um, we don't know why he did this, but it must be all for the good. Those same people will at the same time tell you that they know that God is good and benevolent and stuff like that. Um, and the, the only right post to that is to say, well, how do you know that? That's what new atheists do. And you deem faith not agreeing with the theologians as incorrect. That is, your faith is the right one, everybody else's faith is the wrong one. The best way to argue with a theologian is to ask that person, how do you know that you're right and the Muslims are wrong? Okay, and then watch the fun that happens when you do that. And finally, and I'll give you an example of this, you quote what another theologian says and then blithely go on and assume that what that theologian says tells you what's true. And so therefore, a statement that somebody makes offhand, you assume it's true. Okay, so here's some examples of each of these. First of all, the Bible doesn't say what it seems to say. Even Aquinas and um, Augustine believed in the literal truth of the story of the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. All humanity descended from these two individuals. They sinned. That was the original sin. It caused the fall. That's what Jesus came back to save humanity from. We know now from science that this could not have happened. How do we know that? Because population genetics, we can back calculate and tell how small the human population must have been 
during its history. And what we found out in the last couple of years is that it could not have been smaller than about 1,200 people. So at no time did we ever have a bottleneck of two people, Adam and Eve. Okay, so how do theologians respond to that? Well, they say, we knew it all along, it was just a metaphor, you know. But of course, when you do that, then you're making this argument as well, that, that Jesus died for a metaphor. And what does that mean? I mean, this is why Adam and Eve is so confusing and confounding to religious people now. Because without the existence of Adam and Eve, Jesus makes no sense of the resurrection and, the, and him being a savior makes no sense. And yet we know that Adam and Eve doesn't exist. So what are you doing? And it's really humorous to see theologians say, well, there might have been like 2,000 people, but two of them were designated as sort of the heads of everybody else, you know. Like, but that's, you know, I mean, that's just making stuff up post facto to, to save what you want to believe. It's a lot easier to believe that this whole thing is just fiction. And if you find the refutation of a story that's as pivotal as Adam and Eve, that should breed in you some skepticism about the rest of the Bible, okay? Because we know how the Bible was written as a collection of fables that were put together by various people at various times. Um, there may be some historical truth in there, but this ain't one of them, okay? Um, rationalizations of things you already believe. That's what, the, sci unlike science, where what you want to believe is completely irrelevant, in theology it is pivotal. Here's John Hott talking about the afterlife. We have no evidence for the afterlife. Nobody's come back. The people that claim to speak from the dead are not credible. Um, so as far as we know, there's no evidence for an afterlife. Here's John Hott explaining well why he still believes in it. Um, if he was to try to elicit scientific evidence in mortality, that is, where is your evidence, John? I would just be capitulating to the narrow empiricism that underlines naturalistic belief. I'm um, translation, I don't need no stinking evidence for that. You know? I just want to believe it, and here's the proof that he wants to believe it. What I will say is that the hope for some form of a subjective survival is a favorable disposition for nurturing trust and the desire to know. That's a lot of words, which just mean that I believe in the afterlife because it makes me feel better. This is what the Bible says, the assurance of things hoped for. Why does life, do life and evolution entail suffering? To me, the existence of evils and by ev natural evils like tsunamis and hurricanes that kill people willy-nilly, cancers in children, the punishment and suffering of people that have done nothing to deserve it is the Achilles heel of religion because they have never credibly explained why their notion of God, who is invariably omnipotent, omnibenevolent, and omniscient, would do that. Well, theologians grapple with this problem and they have ways of solving it. Here's John Hodd again. Um, I quote him a lot because part of these slides came from a, when I debated him, but I've tried to put other people in as well. Um, Nature's contingencies and evolution's randomness are not indicative of divine impotence. That is, God, doesn't, God could have done something about it but, it, but he didn't want to because he's caring and self-effacing enough to wait for the genuine emergence of what is truly other than God with all the risk, tragedy, and adventure that this patience entails. What he's trying to say here, this is a hallmark of sophisticated theology, is they, they don't use English. They use obfuscation. What he's trying to say is God is sitting up there watching the great human drama and he wants it to be as full of drama and excitement as, as he can. And that's why we have this stuff. Um, this reminded me when I first read this of what Gloucester says in King Lear, as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. What John Hodd is saying is as actors to an audience are we to the god, they watch us for their sport. And in fact, this is what theologians say. That God makes this drama because it's so fulfilling and wonderful. In the meantime, animals get chewed up by other animals. Babies die of leukemia. People get wiped out by hurricanes. But that's all okay. That just adds to the drama. It's like some huge television show that God is watching from above, as in this cartoon. I mean, this, this cartoon really pisses off religious people. But I think it's, at least for some of them, like John Hunt, this is their view of how God operates. Okay, why is God hidden? Every theologian knows there's no evidence for God. It's another problem for them. Why isn't there? Why hasn't God just come down or arranged the stars in a pattern saying, I am Yahweh, I exist. I mean, there's an infinite number of ways that God could make himself convincing to us. I differ from some other atheists in my view that yes, there, are some, there could be some evidence that God exists. Um, but 
There isn't any, and religious people know that, so they have to deal with the problem of why is God hidden, and this instantiates their other tactic. They make stuff up. It is essential to religious, this is, this is one of my favorite of all theological quotes, it is essential to religious experience, after all, that the ultimate reality be beyond our grasp. Because if we could grasp it, it would not be ultimate. <laughs> That's not only an incorrect definition of ultimate, but it's also a tautology. So at the same time, here's John Polkinghorne and Nicholas Beale in their book recently. Well, the presence of God is veiled because when you think about it, of course when you think about it, the naked presence of divinity would overwhelm us depriving us of truly being ourselves and freely accepting God. I mean, this, they're just making this up as a rationalization for the fact that there is no evidence for God. There's a more, a more parsimonious hypothesis, which is by Dallas Buchanan, the invisible and the non-existent look very much alike. And you might want to consider the fact that there's no evidence for God it means that God doesn't exist. But theologians will not do that. They, they, they'd rather do this kind of gyration in order to do that. Every possible observation can be comported with religion. Evolution is the greatest killer of belief that has ever happened on this planet because it showed that some of the best evidence for God, which was the design of animals and plants that, that so wonderfully matched their environment, could be a result of this naturalistic, blind, materialistic process of natural selection. So, you know, and there's so much evidence for evolution, I wrote a book about it, that you cannot be intellectually respectable human being and deny it. And smart theologians don't deny it, they just rationalize it and say, well, yeah, Genesis is wrong, but really, I mean, it's better that evolution happened because that's the way God should have done it in the first place. And here's two theologians doing that. It isn't a tribute to God that the world is not passive party in the Creator's hand, but is an inherently active and self-creator process, one that can evolve and produce new life on its own. A world of, and this is Francisco Ayala, who's an evolutionary genesis like me, a world of life with evolution is much more exciting. So, so whatever you find, you can rationalize it by just saying, well, it's like I could have had a V8 with, but using evolution. I mean, we didn't realize that God used evolution as his way of creating, and that's a much better way than just poofing things into existence. The curious thing is that why would the Bible not say that then if that was the truth? And if the Bible is true. This kind of rationalization is what I call the sausage grinder of sophisticated theology, where they take scientific necessities and grind them up and convert them into theological virtues. So <laughs> evolution is really a virtue. That's God, that shows how much better God is than we really realize, because he, he doesn't just make things in existence. He creates a universe that keeps changing and creating itself. And isn't that so much more wonderful and miraculous than the way the Bible says? Unfounded claims to understand the nature and intention of God. Um, the Trinity is one of these. You probably know that the Trinity is not in the Bible. It's based on loose interpretations of the Bible. It was decided by theological congresses that decided, yes, there's a three-in-one God. Um, here's a, a Christian physicist saying God is relational, one God. You had a trinity, three persons in full in relationship of perfect love, and each of the persons is full in God. God, the persons are distinct yet inseparable and interrelated. As a scientist, when you say, see something like this, your first response is, how do you know that? I mean, there's lots of people that aren't Trinitarians, like Unitarians, or Christian scientists, or um, um, Mormons. So we have these conflicting faiths, each of them claiming they know something about the nature of God. Proof by quotation, this is the last one. You can see this frequently in theological literature. Somebody will quote another theologian like Alfred North Whitehead, who's the founder of process theology, also a scientist, and they'll start by saying, well, according to Whitehead, this is, what, this is how God is. This is process theology in which God is not static. He changes. He's not completely um, omnipotent, um, the and he's affected by the world. This is another interpretation of theology. And Ian Barber, who's a physicist, wrote a book about this, and he says, well, according to Whitehead, this is, how, this is the way God is. And then he just goes on for the rest of the book and assumes that this is true. You know? So this is proof by authority. It's as if somebody said, well, according to, um, to Max Planck, light is emitted in quanta. And you don't need any evidence for that. Then you just go on and, and assume that he's right just because he's a Max Planck and said this. Okay. So this is another way that theologians deal with the issue of um, religious difficulties. As I said before, different faiths give different answers about what the nature of the world. Here's some of the big questions that John Hott says religion is there to answer. 
What's going on in the universe? Is there any point to it at all? Why are we here? How should we live? Does God exist? Blah, blah, blah. Um, most of these questions are unanswerable or are given different answers by different faiths. Some of them science can answer. Like, why is there so much suffering? Well, natural suffering is a byproduct of natural selection and the idea that pain is an adaptation to let you know that something's going wrong with your body. Why do we die? Science has an answer for that too, which I won't go into now. But in general, these questions that religion says it's going to answer, it doesn't answer, or that different religions answer in a different ways. Okay? And in fact, after raising this, Hot says that, in, I'm not sure this is the same book. Yeah, it is in the same book, different page. The transient and expected death of the cosmos defy our attempts to state clearly what the point of it all is. So he admits that, yeah, we have all these big questions that we're in the process of answering, but we don't know what the answers are. And they never will, because they have no way of knowing what the answers are. Okay, religion fights back. I'm not going to go too deeply in this. Um, accusations against science and scientists. After religion has or theologians have failed to successfully defend their realm against the incursions of science, they decide to fight back and attack science on various grounds. And I won't go into this in detail. I just want to show you some of the grounds they attack science on. First of all, they say science is a faith, like religion. It's not a faith. We don't believe without evidence. I, I could rebut these later if you want. A lot of them will say, well, science was founded by religious people like Newton. But everybody was religious back in Newton's day. That doesn't say anything. Um, science can't prove that God doesn't exist. Yeah, that's true. We can't prove that anything doesn't exist, but we can make pretty good stab at it. Um, science fosters scientism, the view that science is the only reliable God to guide the truth. Lots of books about this. Science gives us no moral grounding. True, but neither does religion. And science has been misused. The atom bomb, eugenics, Hitler, etc. These are all things that are brought up by theologians in an attempt to drag science down to the level of religion. Because that's exactly what they're doing when they make these kinds of arguments. Especially this first one here, which really ticks me off. Okay, so to end, a lot of people are always calling for a dialogue between science and faith. There was a conference at CERN, the physics organization in Switzerland, a couple of weeks ago in which they got together a number of theologians and a number of physicists hoping for a productive dialogue between them. Now, I don't know what that means exactly, to have a productive dialogue between scientists and physicists, because such a dialogue can only really be a monologue. Um, can science and faith contribute to each other? And uh, Can science contribute to faith? Certainly it can. I've already shown you how it can because it disproves the faith's assertions about the world. It's disproved Adam and Eve. It's disproved the flood. It's disproved the existence of a spontaneous creation. Um, we've come pretty close to disproving the fact that people can't come back when they're dead. But, you know, maybe that was a one-off. So science can contribute to faith, but only in the sense of eroding faith. Can faith contribute to science? And the answer is absolutely not. I can't think of a single thing that religion has ever done to, to foster the progress of science. Now you can say, well, Newton and the early Christian scientists were motivated in their science by, to, to tr by trying to understand God's plan. Well, maybe that's true, and maybe at that time it was possible that religious impulse pushed science forward a bit, but certainly not no, no longer. Religion has nothing to contribute, as far as I can see, to faith. We have no need to engage ourselves with theologians or people that believe in the supernatural. That only impedes science. It doesn't forward it. And therefore, because of this sort of one-way feedback of information, science has greater authority than theology. There's no doubt about that. Theologians know it. They're on the defensive but they don't like it, and they claw tooth and nail back to try to gain some respectability. Why does this matter? Okay, to end up with, why, does it, why do I care whether science or religion are compatible? Because, well, I wouldn't care if people kept their religions to themselves, but the, m many people don't do that. Religion is rarely a personal matter in the same way that other personal beliefs are, like if you, st you do stamp collecting or you like to drink fine wine or something. Um, if people didn't think a religion was a reliable way to attain truth, they wouldn't enforce their truths on others. So there's something about religion where you think that somebody from above has given you the absolute truth that impels you, not all religions, but some religion, impels you to try to enforce that truth on other people. So if you think you have the absolute truth, unlike science, where we don't think we have the absolute truth, 
religious, the religious truth is of a different nature. It's an absolutist nature. And it's a truth that sort of, in many religions, compels you to try to make other people believe the same way you do. Not just by talking to them, but by making your beliefs force of law. Um, this is a, a statement that just was revealed. This is a textbook in Toronto for Islamic kids at a school. And this is the relevant part. The divine faith, this is what's taught to school kids. The divine faith guided by holy precepts and instructions of Islam is to endeavor to rescue the oppressed masses, to establish peace and justice, to acquaint the unaware people of the whole world with Islam and Islamic rules and regulations. What they mean here is jihad. You don't just... Um, endeavor to rescue them, you do it at the point of a sword. That's really what this book is about here. So this is basically an explicit statement that we know what the truth is, and by God, we're going to make everybody else adhere to it. And that's why making religion into a kind of scientific endeavor is bad, because it causes you to then force these truths on other people. This is better, best instantiated by the Catholic Church, its various positions. I showed this, this slide in my debate with the Catholic theologian John Hott. He found it so offensive that he tried to censor the video of our debate because he said this would certainly offend people um, who are Catholics. But I think it's true. The Catholic Church, because they have a position of knowing the absolute truth on certain issues, have enforced a number of doctrines which I consider deeply pernicious to society. And here's some of them. Opposition to birth control also to prevent AIDS. They would rather have people die from AIDS than use birth control. If there's ever an odious position, that's one of them. Opposition to abortion, especially in Ireland, where this woman died a couple weeks ago because uh, the fetus still had a heartbeat, even though it was stuck inside and going to die. Opposition to divorce, opposition to homosexuality. These are all official positions of the Catholic Church as codified in their documents or dogma, control of people's sex lives, oppression of women. This is a feature of almost every religion. And if you want to look at the diagnostic feature of religion, one of them would be oppression of women. And you've, done that, you've shown this again this week by your refusal to let women become bishops in the Anglican Church. Sexual abuse of children. Um, I, didn't, I, doubt, I waver a little bit about this because I wonder, well, is this really an official position of the Catholic Church? <laughs> but... It's so clear that there was an institutionalized cover-up of what happened to the rape of children that I do consider that a position. And the only reason this happened is because the Catholic Church claims for itself a respectability and a knowledge of the truth and an ability to control the lives of its adherents that they could get away with this. Installation of fear and guilt in children. I, I, how many of you know somebody that's been traumatized for life by Catholicism? I know quite a few. Even into their 40s, some people still bear this residuum of guilt which works itself out in various ways. None of this would be around if religion did not claim that it had the bearing of the truth. If there was no religion in this world, we wouldn't have any of these things at all because none of these make any sense except in a religious framework. Okay, so tr real truth does not come from God. If you think you got real truth from God, you're wrong and you're liable to impose it on other people, which is almost uniformly bad. It comes from empirical investigation and analysis, i.e. the scientific method construed broadly. Christopher Hitchens said this so well, what can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence. Religion is an assertion without evidence. It is an attempt to fool yourself in the most invidious and pervasive ways. And a final quote from Stephen Hawking, when religion, and I think religion will disappear. I mean, people say religion is with us to stay. Um, to those people, I have one word answer, Scandinavia, where it's gone away in the last two or 300 years. It can go away, and it is going away, and science is one of the forces that is making it go away, and it will win because it works. Science does answer questions about the universe. It doesn't tell us what the meaning of our lives is, but neither does religion. It doesn't tell us what moral how to behave morally, or, but neither this religion. Those come from secular ruminations. So that's all I have to say, and I'll be glad to answer questions.